Today on Context, Stolen Sisters, a voice for Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women. Renelle Harper, beaten and left for dead by a frozen river, won the nation's attention, not just in her ordeal and survival, but in reviving the call for an inquiry into missing Indigenous women and girls. With more than a thousand and counting dead or disappeared Aboriginal women and girls, momentum is growing for a national dialogue. In a moment, Lorna discusses this renewed call to action with the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Then some background from the Native Women's Association of Canada. National Chief Perry Bellegarde joins us in a moment, but first, here's Sheldon Neal with some fast facts. Thank you, Lorna. Well, let's get right into it. Indigenous women are four times more likely to be murdered than non-Indigenous women in Canada. Indigenous women are more likely, again, than non-Indigenous women to be killed by casual acquaintances. And this last interesting point here, vulnerability factors include unemployment, intoxication, and having a criminal record. National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Bellegarde. We are very honored that you're joining us on Context. You know, we actually are broken hearted that Aboriginal women are four times more likely to be murdered than non-Aboriginal Canadian women. Why is their risk so high? We initially thought there was only 600 uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And then with the RCMP study, we find out it's 1,200 and uh, the demographics and the statistics are there and they're probably just scratching the surface, they're probably even more. And so one of the reasons why we say we need this, this inquiry is to really address the root causes. Why is that? Why are those numbers so high? Why are they so prone to violence? How do men view women? You know, like their lives matter, their lives are important. And so we got to keep devising uh, strategies. We've got to start bringing together all levels of government to focus on an action plan to deal with this issue and part of that action plan is, is what we're working on February 26th and 27th coming up but as well we're still pushing for that national federal public inquiry into missing murder indigenous women and girls to really get into the public education awareness but allow for healing for the families but as well to create a dialogue to open people's eyes that this is just not right this is not proper and to start looking at recommendations and solutions to deal with it. National Chief Bellegarde, 90% of these women are murdered by someone they know, and the majority of the killers, of course, are men. What can be done about what we're calling the man problem? Well, a lot of it stems from, uh, basically, we've, we're facing the intergenerational effects of cultural genocide via the residential school. And, and we all know that was a breakdown of the individual, that was a breakdown of the self, that was a breakdown of family, that was a breakdown of community. And so individuals, and a lot of them are men, coming out of that system don't know how to care, don't know how to love, don't know how to raise a family. You know, they were physically abused, they were sexually abused, they're not healthy people. And so we need to start looking at wellness centers, we need to start looking at getting back to their elders' teachings of respect and love and caring and, and honesty and courage, humility, all those seven teachings. We have to start coming back to that. And, and that's one way, if you're healthy as an individual and you start pointing the finger at yourself first rather than out here at other people, you're healthy as an individual. And then if you're healthy as an individual, you can start raising healthy families. National Chief, how did you enter that journey of wellness? Tell us about your path to health. Well, I was, uh, again, just listen to the elders' teachings, the guidance, you know, the mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. All those have to be in balance. And for me, I got first exposed to those teachings from the elders at the Saskatchewan Indian Federated College. It's now the First Nations University of Canada. And the, they had a strong elders component there as part of the education system. And, and just listening to their teachings, listening to their, their, their guidance, their words, and then starting to participate in the ceremonies, the sweat lodge ceremonies, the sun dance ceremonies, it really is about balance. And, and that's how, for me as an individual, um, became connected, if you will, and, and be able to walk in both worlds. And that's continually the message we give to our young people. Walk in both worlds, but know who you are. And those, lang those language and those ceremonies are so key to our survival. 
as we face this huge heartbreak of stopping this wreckage of violence, are you saying that this personal wellness approach is going to be part of your strategy towards national repair? I believe it has to be part of that. We have to start looking at action-oriented strategies for, to deal with the root causes from housing, inadequate housing, to deal with safe shelters, to deal with daycares, you know, to make sure that the, the, the women and girls have their proper supports in place. But as part of that strategy as well is to deal with the whole wellness of the individual and the wellness family, or for the family as a whole as well. You shocked me when you put it bluntly that colonialism has made Canadians see Aboriginals as a problem and never a partner. And it's time for Canadians to see your people as a partner. I want to know what we should see. How, how does this have to work? Canada is rated sixth in terms of the United Nations Human Development Index. It's up here. You apply those same indices to Indigenous peoples, we're 63rd. So we need to close that gap. And we can only do that by reaching out to fellow Canadians, reaching out to members of parliament, reaching out to the premiers, because there's a high social cost to that gap. So we need investments in housing, investments in education, investments in training, and even embracing new concepts like revenue sharing, like treaty implementation, um, embrace Aboriginal rights and title, you know, and, and so that's how we can really close that gap together. You know how impatient Canadians are. We live in a time of a rapid social media change and the instant everything. We are bad at waiting. Speak to our impatience with this healing process. We've had over 150 years of colonization and oppression. You know, it was, I always say four words can capture what happened to indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island. It was, first it was civilize the indigenous peoples because they're pagan, assimilate the indigenous peoples, then it was terminate the indigenous peoples, and now it's integration. But integration can work both ways. And now we're, because of the, the reconciliation process, you know, we have to heal ourselves on both sides. And that's gonna take time. If we can make key investments in education and training, accept that we are different as indigenous peoples, that we have shared the land and resource wealth with everybody in this country, accept that we've got to change the curriculum so that treaties are taught in the systems, inherent rights are taught in that system, or even start looking at embracing us as not a third order of government in Canada, but as a first order of government. Because that's where we need to start looking at and getting our laws rec respected, the creator's law respected and recognized. And that's going to take some time, but I think we're up for the challenge and I think we can do it. Perry Bellegarde, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, thank you for joining us from Ottawa. You're very welcome. Thanks for the opportunity, Lauren. With us now is Dr. Don Harvard, Vice President of the Native Women's Association of Canada and President of the Ontario Native Women's Association. Welcome to Context, Don. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Oni, I guess. You're Ojibwe. Yes. So we should say Oni. <laughs> Your organization, Don, has led the charge in uh, bringing international attention to what the chief explained is the human rights shift. You know, 63% versus the top six. What was the breaking point for you when you said, we have to put international attention on Canada's disparity and how Aboriginal lifestyles are here? Well, in fact, it was specifically the problem of year after year after year of more and more women, somebody's sister goes missing, somebody's daughter goes missing, and nobody taking it seriously. No matter how hard we tried, the, the vigils, the protests, the pro there just didn't seem to be any sort of response or care or concern for this situation, so we decided it really did need to be taken to a different level in the hopes that somebody outside of the Canadian context would be able to take it seriously and shine some light on this tragedy here. I just want to pause at that for a minute because I've been trying to get my head around how I would feel if my young adult daughter just went missing. And you guys did have vigil after vigil. And we really didn't care. We didn't do anything. Well, even if we look at the, the most recent comments from Prime Minister Harper that, you know, this issue that the issue of the call for national inquiry, these things are not high on his radar in terms of priorities. That's a huge concern for me, that the, the very body, the very leadership of our country 
doesn't even see it on their radar, clearly there's a problem. Okay, the international report, uh, it claims that Canadian authorities failed to protect Indigenous women. It's very kind in its preamble. It says Canada's government is trying to work with this, but it has got underlying social uh, marginalization and discrimination. What do you believe should be done to turn this around? Well, number one, we have been talking about the need for the national inquiry, and we firmly believe that that will allow us to really understand in a practical way the day-to-day -day realities because we can talk about racism, we can talk about sexism and colonialism in nice big theoretical ways that you know work in university lectures, but what does that mean in terms of the day-to-day -day life in the streets when you're calling the police station because your sister is missing and they're saying, well, that's just one less prostitute on my strip. And so that's exactly what we need to see, is where people are falling through the cracks. And yet you have made the case, Dawn, that Aboriginal girls are born into high risk. Explain that. Well, this is exactly one of the things, when we heard even with your fast facts, you know, talking about the vulnerability factors, and, and it's very often said that Indigenous women in Canada tend to live high-risk lifestyles. And it's really a blame-the-victim kind of approach, that it was their fault for choosing these high-risk lifestyles, which, you know, they're talking about being on the streets, maybe being involved with drugs or, or crime. And we're saying, you know, our, our women did not choose a high-risk lifestyle. There were not little girls who were wanting to grow up and be homeless. They are born high-risk in Canada because of that history of colonization, because of the broken treaties, because of residential schools and child welfare agencies, and communities without proper housing. People living 17, 20 people in a home with no water, no plumbing, no hydro, yeah. you know, no employment. These uh things make our people their they're born high risk. We just can't say it loud enough what, what the report has discovered of over 60% ranking below the standard of living for just the Aboriginal people. Back to the violence of the, that has made victims of these 1,200 women and missing girls. Men are the perpetrators. What are we going to do about the man problem? One of the things we are looking at, because it is not enough to always just be removing the women, taking them from the homes, putting them in shelters, intervening after the fact, you know, with, with punishment and in that way, it's really about how do we stop it in the first place? So how do we break the cycle and start teaching not just Aboriginal men, but you know, even when we talk about them being murdered by an acquaintance, there's this assumption that that means it's Aboriginal men. And that's simply not true. One of the things we're trying to do is, is start retraining, start um, having conversations about things that, attitudes, you know, things that are those long-standing attitudes towards women that people haven't thought about, you know, the, the psychological abuse, the emotional abuse, the controlling a woman's income, you know, monitoring where she goes, those kinds of things that a great many men feel that because I haven't actually punched you in the face or slapped you around, that I'm not an abusive partner. And when we've sat down and worked and, and looked at the situation and said, you know, there are a great range of behaviors that happen long before you hit that, that physical violence, that they just don't see as abusive. And that's, that's not just Aboriginal community, that's Canadian society as a whole. You have done a lot of work about keeping women and girls safe. Tell us about the project of the Faceless Dolls. With this project, we go into the communities and to, to educate so that the average Canadian citizen really has no idea that this is happening here in Canada. We might live five minutes or five kilometers from a First Nation and not realize that there are even Indigenous people right there and certainly have no idea. So with the faceless dolls, it's very symbolic of, I mean, the massive numbers of young girls, of Indigenous women and girls who are going missing and how society really perceives it as just without a face. You know, they're, they're just numbers. And that's why we're really trying to get that understanding across that this is somebody's sister and that we have to stop 
viewing them as just faceless numbers. So it's, it's really symbolic to try to help people understand. And when you see body, the doll after doll after doll after doll, you realize the significance of the numbers. Somebody's daughter, somebody's mom, somebody's grandma. Don, you do wonderful work at uh, the National Association. It, this is really, this is, this is hard for you, isn't it? It is. Um, this summer, we went out to Prince Edward Island to talk with the premiers from each province, and they have all come forward in support. And, and while I was driving, I thought, you know, this was the last week of the summer, I would take my daughters with me. I have three daughters. They're 17, 10, and, and 5. And on our way out there, the one who was 10, and, and they always hear things that they shouldn't listen. And, so she started asking, well, what is this all about? And so I explained to her that Indigenous women are going missing, they're being murdered, and the risks. And it took her a minute, and then she looked at me and she said, but Mommy, we're Native, right? And I said, yes. And she says, and I'm a girl? I said, yes. And she looks at me and says, does that mean I'm in danger? And it broke my heart because I couldn't, I wanted to just look at her and say, no, of course not. I will protect you. I will take care of you. But I know it's not that simple. Because of the work we're doing here, I realize that as a young Indigenous girl in Canada, she is absolutely very much in danger. So that's why this is so important, so that hopefully we can move forward in the next generation. We won't have to be answering that question to our babies. Dr. Don Harvard, uh, Vice President of the Native Women's Association of Canada, President of the Ontario Native Women's Association. I'm so glad you are teaching us to care. Thank you. Thank you so very much for having us here today. Coming up, Cheryl Bear from Northern BC's Highway of Tears. Head to our website to enter our free draw for Lorna's books. And this week, it's Thomas King's The Inconvenient Indian. The Globe and Mail describes it as essential reading for everyone who cares about Canada and who seeks to understand Native people, their issues, and their dreams. So to win your free copy and learn more about an issue that is dear to all of our hearts here at Context, simply go to our website, contextwithlorna.com, and click on Lorna's books for your chance to win. This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy, helping you help others. Cheryl Bear is a band counselor and an award-winning musician from the Nadley Wotan First Nation in Northern BC. It was her song named A Prayer for Murdered and Missing that we listened to during our photo montage. And Cheryl is joining us today from the uh, Coast Salish Territory. Welcome uh, to Context, Cheryl. Thank you, Lorna. It's good to talk to you again. You know, Cheryl, the northern BC road from Prince George to Prince Rupert is now called the Highway of Tears because of the Aboriginal women who have been murdered along its route. You are a band counselor right through there. Your reserve is located along this road. Tell us about the friends you have lost. Well, um, there's been quite a few. Uh, just last year on my reserve, there was a murder. Um, uh, we lost Destiny Tom and it remains unsolved to this day. <clears throat> also, there have been um, many, I mean, not only recent, but years past, there have been many murders. I remember talking to an elder named Violet Samper, who's since passed, um, but she said, she told me one day that I, she re I reminded her of her daughter, and we, because um, we were laughing and joking around, and, and immediately she said, I haven't seen my daughter for 40 years. That was about almost 20 years ago. And that was along Highway 16 that her daughter walked away and was never seen again. This could easily be remedied by a good transit system. You know, along Highway 16, if they would just put something in place, because there's a lot of times there's, you know, girls out there hitchhiking who just simply need a ride. And they, they're 
trying to be wise and trying to be smart about it, not get in a car that they think is iffy, but still those dangers exist. And instead of looking at the girl and saying, this is your fault, uh, we have to say, what kind of infrastructure can we put around and in place that'll make these places safer? So now let's just draw back on the national issue of these nearly 1,200 murdered and missing women and our conversation between your Aboriginal people, our founding peoples, and my people. What do you think the spiritual issue is in this story? What kind of spiritual issues surface? Well, in my mind, God is um, much more angry at injustice than I am. And when I think about the women that I have known who have gone uh, missing or who have been murdered, uh, it's Destiny Tom, Nina Joseph, Kim Casimir, Olivia Williams, Serena Abbotsway, uh, the last two who were found on the Picton farm. Uh, you know, I can't help but be overwhelmed and I can't help but feel a, a, a real anger and, and about these issues and a real hurt and uh, I had a crisis of faith a few years ago when I was listening to some of the stories of the TRC. <clears throat> and I've heard these stories all my life. I've heard uh, the stories of our courageous and beautiful elders talking about the travesties that happened to them and the residential school, the horrible abuses. And I just took a step back and said, God, where were you? Where were you when these little children were being uh, so horribly abused? And I think that that is an honest and an uh, okay reaction. You know, when you read the Psalms, you see people who are really human. They're really asking tough questions. And, and God lets us, God lets us be human and ask those tough questions. And it took a few months for me to, I think, hear God and to, um, to receive what I believe was uh, the best answer that I can give today, and that is that God is much more angry at these things than I am. He is much more angry at the perpetrators of sin than, than I am. Thank God we can stand behind Jesus. But for this, these injustices, it gave me a, a sense of peace to know that the God of justice, the God who, who is going to make things right, is on our side and is pulling for us. You just mentioned that, thank God, we can stand behind Jesus for this kind of stuff. What, what inspiration have you drawn from his life, his examples? Well, uh, Jesus was a person who lived under the oppression of the Roman government, and his uh, cousin, his first cousin, was murdered by this government. Uh, we read the story of uh, John the Baptist, who was beheaded, and it was a horrific death, and it was a terrible time in their history. And to read that, and to realize that I, as a First Nations person, who I have so many first cousins who are like my brothers and sisters, and I think Jesus, as a tribal man, would have, their families would have been similar. Uh, and for us, second cousins are like nieces and nephews, or they're like your kids. I have second cousins who call me mom. Uh, so this tight-knit community uh, that we have as First Nations, I read it in the Bible and I see Jesus grieving over his first cousin who was brutally murdered over, uh, you know, because of uh, an oppressive government. We, as white people, feel we will never be able to say sorry enough for what we did with the residential schools, with colonialism. Is there anything we in the non-Aboriginal church can do to help now? Well, we as Indigenous people, we don't need pity or uh, those kind of things. And you know, you talk about saying sorry, and we always appreciate that. Uh, but when, if I have a disagreement with my husband and we, we say sorry, then that sorry is uh, almost, um, you know, it has to be followed up with a change in behavior. Otherwise, the sorry, the apology is meaningless. And that's a really important issue as well. And in my travels across Canada, I've gotten to visit churches where I see pastors and I see leaders, I see 
uh, church lay people who are really interested, who are really engaging with these issues with First Nations people, and they want to see change. They want justice to happen. And that really encourages me. Well, Cheryl Bear, uh, thank you very much for joining us from the Coast Salish Territory. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Lorna. Band counselor and musician Cheryl Bear joined us from Vancouver. When we return, some final thoughts on a tragedy too often ignored. I'm Rose Meter. I'm a mom, a wife, and an ER doctor in rural Canada. This year, my husband Rob and I have decided to take our four kids on a trip around the world. We have no idea what lies ahead. I'll be updating our journey on the Context with Lorna Duick website with blog posts and videos about our triumphs and trials and adventures. Won't you join us? Head to our website to enter our free draw for Lorna's books. And this week, it's Thomas King's The Inconvenient Indian. The Globe and Mail describes it as essential reading for everyone who cares about Canada and who seeks to understand Native people, their issues, and their dreams. So to win your free copy and learn more about an issue that is dear to all of our hearts here at Context, simply go to our website, contextwithlorna.com, and click on Lorna's Books for your chance to win. Coming soon on Context, Commander Chris Hadfield takes over ground control at Context. Don't miss learning with us from Canada's best known astronaut. He tells how lessons in space give us tools for life on Earth. There's much national evidence that Canadians are apathetic to our founding peoples. The faceless dolls we saw earlier symbolize a wide public indifference towards the nearly 1,200 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We've reached a tipping point for action, but at what a price. In the Bible, we learn of a God who counts the very hairs on our heads, meaning God not only knows each of us personally, God cares deeply for each one, and he's passionate for justice. And following God's example, we are asked to bring God's love and healing into our own hearts and into our land. We've left some learning links on that at our website. It's an important issue for us all to get educated on. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. I think it's sad, actually, in a way, because I think that uh, these women come to the bigger centers to uh, to get a better life, and on the way, something happens to them, and it's it's we don't know what happens to them. We can surmise what happened to them, but we don't really know what happens to them, and it's really sad that they can't get here for a better life. And uh, I just feel that there needs to be a lot more education done with respect to the whole issue of Aboriginal women and <clears throat> where they're coming from and what they're going to. There's not, a, there's not been enough progress in terms of uh, how uh, the whole issue is being dealt with. Uh, I mean, it's fine to say government should try and solve it. Uh, I think uh, there needs to be, I think, a give and take on both the Aboriginal side of governments and on the federal government side to try and get together to really resolve what's happening to these women and really try and find a solution. It's not too late to send us your comments Voicemail, email, Facebook, or Twitter. The conversation continues.